All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Julie, and I'm with the programming department here at Woodbridge Library. Uh, thank you all for attending tonight's program, Stories of Travel by Stagecoach and Horse. Um, and before we get started, I just want to remind everyone to check out our other upcoming events. You can go to our website at www.woodbridgelibrary.org and click on the calendar to see everything there, and you can register. Uh, also, summer reading is happening right now. We have a summer reading club for adults, teens, and for children. And if you haven't signed up already, you can do that uh, either in person or on our website. So getting back to tonight's program, I just like to remind you all that everyone is gonna be on mute for the duration of the program in order to keep the focus on our speaker. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the general chat or send them to me directly, and we're gonna do a Q&A at the end. Um, so tonight's program is presented by Griselle from the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, which is located in Madison, New Jersey. And I will hand things over to you now, Griselle. Thank you so much. All right, so yes, my name is uh, Griselle Casasola, and I do come from the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. Uh, we are located in 9 Main Street, Madison, New Jersey. Uh, some of you, if you haven't been there, um, this is the beautiful building of our museum. The museum, um, well, it's a museum now. It's been a museum since 1969, but it was uh, actually Madison's um, first library. It was built in 1899, and it was a library until to last century into the 60s. And then it became like really, really small. And eventually um, it was, uh, a, it became a museum when the library moved to the actual library of Madison, New Jersey. Um, so yeah, we, this is, these are some of the few pictures that we have here. This used to be the library uh, reading room. And this is the gallery of the actual museum like we have now. And this picture, I believe this, this, this photo in particular is from 19, it's from 2019, yeah, two years ago. Um, it was a very beautiful sunny day and they were able to take that picture. And so today we're gonna be talking about the stories of travel, it's a very, uh, in educational and a lot of information in this um, program because you might think, oh, I don't know, 200 years later, 250 years later, things are different, of course, and yes, are very different in so many senses, but there are things that we still have the same um, problems and the same issues uh, when we're talking about the roads and the streets here in the United States, specifically in New Jersey. So. We're gonna be talking about um, how people traveled back then in the 19th century. And we're gonna be talking about focusing in horsepower travel before um, the train, when the train and the railroad became something here, especially in the United States. Um, so this, this is like a, um, an example on this first picture here, we have a Crawford House Concord coach. This was uh, used, being used between 1875 and 1885. So it was basically 10 years. And the horse, we're gonna be talking first of all about the horse. So the horse for thousands of years, of course, um, the horse had been the key part of the land transportation. So other than just walking and, and you will not get any other place around without a horse. So you either walk or use a horse, either just riding the horse or in a carriage or a wagon. So um, horses, it was definitely the key part of traveling. They sure work and intrig integral to people's daily lives and to the 20th century, because of course we don't use them as much anymore for traveling in here. Um, but definitely, it was the main the main way of transportation back then. Now the horse the horses shoes. Um, before we we uh, developed this program, I was actually 
learning and taking note of how to clean and maintain, um, of course, the, the horse and the shoes of, of the horses and watching a lot of YouTube channels of how they do it. And it's really extremely important. It's basically a, a task that you have to do every single day if you want your horse to be healthy and then to keep, um, and to keep it healthy and functional. So like people, the horses, they do need shoes to protect their feet, especially imagine 200 years ago, how rough and how, how horrible those, those roads were. So they need it. Um, the horseshoes were actually made especially for each horse by a farrier or a blacksmith. So I actually know people uh, right now that they do keep uh, doing this job. And I, I met um, a person uh, um, yeah, yesterday that his wife is actually a farrier um, and around here, around New Jersey, uh, New Jersey's uh, farmers and farms. And I was like, wow, it's so awesome that I almost met her. I didn't, but I know that it's, it's a job that is really important, especially for, those, for, pe for people who keep um, horses and use it for every, every many, many things. Um, it, it is attached to the horse hoof by hammering the nails through the holes in the horseshoes. Now it doesn't hurt. We I always saw like in the comments and in 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 the um, section that we, the of the videos that we were actually watching, people always ask, does it hurt? I say no, it doesn't hurt because it's just like you know cutting our nails. So the horse, um, the shoes or the the hoof of the of the horse is actually uh, from the same material of our nails, which is keratin, so it doesn't hurt. Um, and having a horse loose, uh, the, the shoes, having it loose will actually affect. So it has to be like really, really, uh, it has to be perfect. The, the, the job has to be done perfectly. Otherwise you will actually eventually um, hurt the, shoe, the horse. Now, caring for your horse. So you see here, you have a few different um, tools in here. We have the brushing, the brushing is to keep of the insects, the dirt, and it also made them to look nice. So you have it to make them look nice. The filing arm is actually here, the hoof wraps, is actually to clean the hoof just like our fingernails. So we do need to trim our nails and you get, we, to get out the dust, the dirt, the rocks, and to file them down as they grow. They do grow and they grow really, really fast. We were actually, Watching also how they take care of the of the donkeys and and everything with the feet of the donkeys and they grow like really really fast. And the boil good it prevents the soreness. So if you don't do that, it actually um, hurts them. So a lot of people say, oh, but what about the wild horses? So it's very different. A wild horse is really the name says it all. It's really really tough. I mean it's wild and it's running every every day. So it's different than a very domestic horse. Uh, when you have it from, from when it's born and everything, you are taking care of that horse from the beginning. So it doesn't have the same roughness or toughness uh, from a wild horse. Now, going into from the horse to the actual carriage, we have here an overall of the carriage and the parts of the, of the carriage. So this is very simple. And here we have the light, None of the none of the carriage, no no. Uh, maybe like I saw maybe one or three in the picture that we were developing. So a regular person, a normal person, will not be able to um, to afford a carriage with so many fancy things, just like a light that came later, and that also it was more common for with the, for the people that actually have the meaning or the money to, to do it. The carriage were just simple. But this one right here is, a, is an example of you have the spoke, you have the step, the spring, the hub. So you have the essentials in the in the carry. So the the light was more later into into the years. It was lit by a candle usually, and it might start being oil lamp towards the ends of the 19th century. So it was definitely something that it was just a candle, and was it significantly an improvement for, of course because it was very hard to, to be driving a carriage with no light at all remember there was no light on, 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 in the roads 
And then you have the shaft. The shaft is connects to the harness right there for the horse. And you have the ellipt elliptical uh, spring where you have more, we're gonna be talking about that more in a minute. And then you have the step to get into the carriage, not always this low, sometimes that step, it was really, really high. So you will actually have to either get the help from someone, some help from someone or have a smaller step and usually basically like a ladder, it was really high. And it, the, in the image here is using to a full long skirt. So imagine women, they were wearing either skirts or a dress. So it was really, really hard, particularly for women to get up inside of the of the carriage. And then we have this the spokes or the hubs more on the wheel. So we're going to be talking about that, about the actual wheel um, soon. But yeah, this is just like the overall of the carriage and the parts. Now in here, the wheel specifically, um, we have a few different parts in here. So we have the hub, which is the center of the wheel in there. We have the spoke, it is connecting the hub to the fellows. So the fellows, the wheel, the spoke shape and the spoke pointer, all of that, the, the spoke is actually connecting all of that. Now we have the fellows are the wooden rim around the outside of the wheel, all of that. And we have the tire itself, iron um, circle around the outside of the fellows. So that's part of the wheel. And then we have the wagon brake shoe, shoes or the drag shoe. In there we have basically just a brake. And it's at the top of the, at the top, of the steep hill, the back of the wheel will be fit between the rows of metal spikes or metal grooves. So this is very, like we said, it's very not safe. Not that safe, it was very, very innovative, but it was, it was some, the first time that they were doing it. So they were actually trying. So some drivers basically avoided using heavy wagon brakes for putting their short their, their horses in danger or on hills. So some of the of the drivers of these carriages, they just not they did not put anything heavy and basically they didn't use the the carriages in into big um in hills because it was really there was just not not an easy way or a possible way to stop and and, and to go especially going down. I mean, it was, they were just trying to, with this, with this break and, and shoe. And eventually they develop a, a, a better way, just more similar as what we have today. But yeah, in the beginning, it was really hard. It was really, it was very difficult. Now a runaway wagon on a hill will trip the horses and the break also actually was to protect the horses, not only to protect the people, but the brakes were also to protect the horses. So they were, this was the, um, the um, actually the pioneer of braking. Um, they were trying to get, to get better and eventually they do. Then we have the suspensions. Now, <laughs> suspensions on this carriage were not good at all. So let's, let's just face it, they were not good. It was in the beginning. Again, you have to think about the um, during the late 1800s, then the 19 at the beginning of the 1900s. Um, it was very difficult. They were inventing so many things, but definitely suspensions suspensions took a long way, a long way to to become safe. Now, combined with poor and very bumpy roads, and this is what I'm referring when I refer at the beginning. Huh. Just yesterday, I was actually doing, I was in the in the um, tire place because we were getting new tires and we were getting uh, a service for our car. And I was actually thinking in this program and I asked the, 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 the um, customer service in there, I, I asked, we have to change something. I asked, but why does it, why is it, is it messed up? Like why, what happened? What did I do? Did I do something wrong? Uh, and, and I damaged my car and he said, no, it's just the roads, the bumpy roads, the, 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 the potholes and everything. I'm like, and I immediately uh, was thinking about, about this program because yeah, roads of course are not that horrible as, as back then, but we still have the same problems, especially that's why cars have now have uh, suspension. Now on paid stumps, um, anything, you name it. This made for an uncomfortable ride because there was only too many options. 
a total of braces. The coach is literally hanging, hanging on them so it doesn't have a direct contact with the wheels and the axle. And the elliptical springs, the metal oval that had a little give in there, on the left, they are loose. And on the cart, on the right, you can see them in place. So it was very, very rough. It was something that it was, they were getting the hang of it. But at the beginning, of course, it was not good. It was very creative and very innovative, but it took time to, to, to perfect it on the idea. Now, the American roads were known to be terrible. Um, Congress passed the General Survey Act in 1824 to promote better roads and canals. 1824, and today, 2021, we still have problems with roads. I mean, United States is gigantic, it's enormous, it's a, a huge country, so it's really hard to keep everything, um, every single road uh, updated and everything, but definitely 200 years ago, Look at here, 1824, they were having problems and today we still are. Now imagine rider riding over a terrible dirty roads while either of these two options, the total braces or the elliptical sprint. So it was very bumpy, it was very hard, it was very difficult for sure. Now, working vehicles. This was much more easier because this is a farm wagon. So, Basically to, to carry different heavy things. It, it didn't have to be pretty. It didn't have to be um, fancy or anything. It did the job, okay? So it did the job. So that was the most important thing. So the farm vehicles were very functional. It was just like a pickup truck today. And they, were, they could transport many, many things in, in a farm. It was actually very functional, definitely for sure. Now we have some interesting information here. So taxis were actually used uh, during this time, during the 1800s in the cities, of course. So a wagon will be used or a carriage will be used to, um, to the purpose of a taxi. So to give someone a ride. Fire and police, the fire and police houses, not departments, but houses, they would actually be, they were actually uh, wagons and carriages also too. So uh, the, what we have today started like more than 200 years ago. And even, you know, a dump truck, this is not nothing, this is not new. It was actually for collecting. Then it was the dumping or the, you know, uh, the garbage and actually other things that they were, they wanted to, to get rid of it in the primary city. So you will be talking in primary cities here, like uh, Newark and Jersey City, and definitely New York City and Philadelphia, the big cities around here, the, this area, they were actually using carriages um, in, and that's the garbage truck today. So it's really, really cool, really amazing. Now, talking about the carriage and traveling in the actual uh, carriage, you can take a look in here, and it's very, very interesting. The difference that you're gonna get to see between this one and the other one that we're gonna see next. <laughs> this one is actually in the late um, 19th century in Missouri. So even though you you might think that this is just a simple, simple uh, carriage, it is actually um, more, a little bit more than just a normal regular person can afford. These people right here in this carriage, they did have a little bit more either money or resources to, to, to be in there. Uh, and just as normal and simple um, carriage will not be like this. It will be even more, more, um, it more simpler than this one. Now, many people could not afford the, their, own, um, their own carriage. So, and even if, if they did, it was gonna be a very, difficult way to use it unless you have a person that actually knew to to ride the the and to drive the carriage um so they would actually have to um to afford a basic wagon or a carriage so this one is not even basic this one is just like right there like right there in the middle in the middle the one here is a relatively more um more 
fancy than the other ones, but it's still probably outside the mean of many Americans. So very difficult for many people. Private carriages were actually taxed in early, in early Americans. And in the first decades after the American Revolution, carriages um, owners were, they had to pay an annual federal tax on each of their vehicles. So <laughs> nothing different from 200 years ago and 300 years ago, even after the American Revolution, they did, they, they had to pay a federal tax. And the Supreme Court upheld the tax in 1796, but the ruling remains controversial even until today. So yeah, so a little bit of information in, in there. Now, talking about more information about Madison, the Stevenson Museum is in Madison. The Sean Pike Road has a very little name. Now the main street in Madison that connects Madison and, and Chatham it was first surveyed in 1801, and this was part of the Morris Turnpike. Now, many people avoided the tolls by traveling on parallel roads instead. So the Sean, the Sean Pike Road in Madison and Sharon received its name this way. People traveled on it to shun the bike. So basically they traveled that way to avoid the tolls. And yeah, I do that too. I, I avoid, I avoid the tolls every time I can. I only take the ones that I have to, that I have to take. So yeah, uh, this is a fun fact in here. Now we're going to see a very, very fancy carriage for sure. Now this one right here, it's from the uh, Vanderbilt uh, family. Uh, like today, if you have the means and you have the money, of course you're going to have like we own a Toyota and we love our Toyota and but we see so many, we have so many brands and everything that that they are three times more expensive than our car. But my car does the same job as their car. So yeah, if you if you have the money and the means, then you can get whatever car you like. But definitely um that hasn't changed. Things to note about this particular carriage. Um, and this one, it was set apart definitely from the other ones. This one is a very fancy and very rare um, a carriage. Now, in here we have for the rider. The rider in here is covered by a roof and sides complete with glass windows, very rare. So if you can actually take a look in there, I'm not there to point you, but yeah, it has the windows, the glass windows. So yeah, a lot of money definitely for, for, for to do something like that. I mean, we have windows today, glass windows in our cars today, but definitely that was something that it was just a privilege, a fancy and luxury to, to do it in those ages. The driver is not covered. Now the, the lantern, not on all the vehicles. Like I said, we do have the lantern in there. Definitely lantern, look completely completely um tiny uh comparing to the to the glass like one of the things that is there is more um captivated that i was captivated by was the the, the glasses yeah the windows now we do not have it uh, visible from this side but on the um on the other side the door of the door this the stairs actually fall down this one from this carriage decreasing the height to the step into the vehicle. So the person who goes in there, either a woman or whoever goes in there, they didn't have to have any problem at all because the stairs fall down. <laughs> I'm like, what? I mean, even in, in pickups today, um, they are really high. People still have tr um, trouble getting inside. Like my mom, my mom is really, she's really short. She cannot get into one of those very high pickups or, or even SUVs that are really high. So this carriage had the folding, uh, the folding stairs. I'm like, oh, wow. Now the color, this will have been an unusual and expensive color for a carriage. This one is color. It looks like a very red or wine color. Another luxury, definitely just luxury. Um, it also do doesn't, have here, I mean, we cannot see it because it's on the other side, but it does have the Vanderbilt family crest. 
And then at the back, there is a place for a groom or a footman to stand to be to help the rider in and out of the carriage. So it does have so many different components. And uh, uh, comparing that one to the one to this one is just <laughs> completely the difference is between nine and eight. But for sure, um, you didn't need these fancy things. Now, the good things about this one is just especially the folding shares that that's something that's what what really um, tracks me and also also the glass uh, windows because those are were really protective. So um, were definitely very, very expensive. The next one, this one is one of the most um, common and more um, um, popular one. We have here Wells Fargo and company. So this one this specifically was for carrying so many things, right? And you even see the US mail in here. Now, this is a huge contrast to the bundle with a uh, carriage because it's just a common carriage. Uh, you don't see anything fancy or any luxury here. This is a way to travel between towns commercially prior to the trains coming in 1830s, right? Now you bought a ticket for a specific distance on this one stage coach. And now <clears throat> this was is not a this was not a pleasant way to travel. Uh, as early as uh, 1825, over 70 stage coaches arrived in Philadelphia alone each day so it was not a pleasant way to travel but it was definitely the more common way to travel because it was easier they had a um they had like the routes and everything they had it like it's just like the trains today it was more more uh, functional this that way now a coach like this i'm gonna give you some numbers in here coach like this could have up to nine passengers possibly even more three at the back facing forward, three in the front facing backwards, which is horrible to me. That's why I don't, when I ride the train, I have to go in the same way, in the same direction that the train is going, otherwise I will get like really, really sick. So yeah, <laughs> three in the front facing backwards and three in the middle on a bench with just a leather strap at their back. Just imagine, try to really try to, <laughs> Digest all of that and, 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 and transport yourself 200 years ago. Up front will be a driver and a second person. Now, you're going to get to learn something really cool today, especially when the stage um, coaches were going through more remote areas. This person might carry a shotgun. Now, again, you see here US mail. And so many the, the banks did not exist at the mom, at the at that moment. So these coaches, these carriages were actually target for thieves. So this after that, and so many, so many um, um robbers, and, and they were a target of, of, of robbers and everything. These were this is where we get the word shotgun because the person next to the driver will actually have to shut. He's gone <laughs> to shove someone to defend the people that it was there with inside from robbers and from thieves. So when we were doing this program, I was like, I mean, I'm not from here. I'm not from New Jersey. I'm not, from, yeah, I'm from Puerto Rico. So we don't use that, that word, but I definitely learned that shotgun whenever you go and you want to sit in, in the front next to the driver. Oh, I call shotgun. And you know it, you must know it because you, it has to be from here. So that's where the, the, the phrase and that's where the, where the word came from. So a little bit of history here for you guys. Now, these were the sentiments of two people uh, by travel in a state coach. So we have the words from Eliza Ralston and Charles Dickens. Uh, definitely uh, to <laughs> underscore how unpleasant the mo this mode of transportation was. Here are two contemporary descriptions one by her and the other one by Charles Dickens. We have uh, by Eliza. My ride to Easton was very disagreeable. It commenced raining when we were six miles from, from town. The roads were extremely bad. The night very dark and quiet late before we got in. We left 
<laughs> there were early in the morning, worse roads I never saw. They were ob obliged to drive five horses greater part of the way to get along at all. We arrived in the city at eight o'clock in the evening. Oh, I guess she just, you know, <laughs> she, uh, she completely put everything in there. I think it was just like um, um, an expression of, of a, re a relief, a feeling of relief that she was done with the, with the, with the travel. Um, the, uh, Charles Deacon says, the very slightest of jolts with which the ponderous carriage fell from log to log was enough. It seems to have dislocated all the bones in the human body. <laughs> this one is even more, more uh, um, specific. Never, never once that day was the coach in any position to which we are accustomed in coaches. <laughs> so yeah, definitely um, not a luxury way to travel. And how does this compare with today? Probably the trains cannot compare because trains are, are not like that around here, especially in New Jersey. But I will say that, I don't know, maybe in buses, but I don't think even in buses you, you feel that way. But definitely around here, I don't think we have that same problem unless you are actually riding a, a, in a carriage with someone. Yeah, definitely. Right here we have a cartoon uh, made by David K. Polo Johnson, traveled by a uh, state coach. So this 1830 cartoon shows a crowded and mysterious stage coach. So of course he said an exaggeration, but it's really not that far from, from how the how the people felt. Definitely not many, not that many people would fit in there. But when you are like, like I said, nine people, three, three, and three in the middle, you will definitely feel like that and claustrophobic and you are. And it's, you are like a held being in a in a can, you know. And imagine just doing that during with during the summer and the humid and, and humidity and July and August like we are today. So yeah, it's very very a struggle for sure. Now in an era when a few people could afford their own horses or carriages, travel conditions like this were even worse and common because for sure, um, like I said, it was just. How many people can you fit? You put it in there and it was very, very uncomfortable for sure. Now, this is something that is really cool. We do have this in the museum. And if we were doing this program right now in person, I will be showing you this and you will be able to actually touch it and see it. But this is really cool. This is a foot warmer. Uh, the idea is amazing because um, I remember when I moved here to New Jersey from Puerto Rico, I had a, a, a lot of uh, hard time. It took me like probably like three or four years to my body to to really get used to the winter and, and especially my, my feet hurt like a lot in, in the process of coming from the Caribbean to this beautiful winter weather and cold uh, climate. So I remember that I needed to warm my feet um, a lot. A lot. And my feet and my hands, but especially especially my feet. So imagine being in a, in a carriage going from any type of distance during the winter in the winter. This was an amazing idea. This was a very innovative um, idea and it will work like this. People use to um, something like this to, to make the trip actually more bearable, of course. The tin that it has the, the punch, it was held by a cup of uh, for hold cold. So you will put in that tin in there, you will put it inside the, the small one, and you will put hold uh, coals. Um, that was the only way, the only way that, I, that an open carriage like that could actually have any any type of, 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 of warm and hot for, for your feet. You will place an underneath a blanket near the travel's feet. And that was the only, the only uh, safe way to do it. Now, it will not remain hot for long. So you will have to keep actually doing, keep doing it. But can you imagine going to anywhere um, in December, January, February, especially, which is uh, even more in an open carriage and, and it's so cold. So this was a very, a very good remedy. It was a portable foot warmer also used in rail cars and early auto 
um, and early cars, um, the very early ones without heating or AC, of course. Now, it, it's very definitely, it's something that, yes, it, it, it wasn't meant to be, for you to be warm the whole trip, but eventually here and there, you will actually have something to warm your feet for sure. Now, this is really cool because it looks like something, instead of something old, it looks like something new. It looks like, like a like a Back to the Future or something like that, um, <laughs> type of, or like the Benjamin Franklin's um, and glasses too. So this is really cool. Stage coach glasses, super cool and very innovative. Look at the, uh, you see the front and you also have a side. So these lenses were actually the lenses to protect the travels, the eyes from dust, and from everything in the journey. Instead of windows, early stage coaches had cloth of leather flaps around attached to the roofs. All right, so this is really, really cool. The traveler sitting on the side of the coach nearest the roast, they would actually have to be like, um, had the dustiest right in there. So the glasses came in many colors, but the glasses came for one purpose only so you will protect your eyes and you will protect your face for everything that can go like wind dust anything that can that can um, affect you when you're going outside so if you if you actually open a window right now in your car and you don't have anything you can actually uh, dust can get in your that i need i need my, my my glasses i have my sunglasses i have to use them so these were the sunglasses of the 1800s uh, and definitely seems very modern in appearance. That's what I say. They're old, but they look really, really new, really modern. Now take a look at this, uh, measuring distance. Um, this is, again, very innovative. Uh, we may see that many of these tools and everything, we might see them all, but that's what I love about history that you get to learn so many things. These were things that were really, really functional and the ideas never stopped to amaze me because this is what we use now. I'm more modern or everything, we don't use exactly like this one, but we, we keep using these type of tools, especially for doing the surveyor, the sur surveyors and, and, and we still have that. We, we have Google map, we have everything. We have, what is the other one? Wait, I, I don't remember what is the other one, the, the navigation system, but one we still use that it's the same idea so it's really amazing this one what the was the surveyors or gunsters chain basically was invented by the english mathematician edmund gunter and he used the chains like this to measure distance along proposed route for roads and railroad some chains like this one had only 50 links to make it lighter the chain meant they had a difficult job because they often had to work on very hilly or rocky uh, terrain. Later were levered during construction. So try to imagine the roads and the streets and the highways that we have today. Try to imagine that between mountains. It was hills everywhere, hills everywhere. And eventually they became what we have today, but before it was it's just high rocks. And, and they were trying to basically destroy mountains and destroy rocks to actually develop a, a road or a highway or whatever, or a, a street. So this was very important. These type of tools were definitely very important. Now making the actual uh, roads, we still have this. Just a few, a few days ago, I, don't, I think I was going to the museum and I saw some of the service they were actually taking pictures so they were doing something either to updating or something we still use these type of tools more modern but we still do the surveyor's compass that we have in here which use a bra they will use a brass compass like this one to measure and record the direction of new roads and railroads before they were built so that's really awesome that even in the 1800s, you know, in the 19th century, they were developing of this. And, and, and for example, where the museum is in 9, 9 Main Street in Madison, you're gonna get to see 
uh, pictures from 1913, and you're gonna get to compare hundred almost like 1913, uh, and now we're 20, 21, so it's more than a hundred years. So you, we still walk around the same roads. We still drive around the same road that were developed and, and built um, 200 years ago. So it's amazing. Now the first step in building a road or the railroad is to survey possible routes. So they will actually go and use all of these tools and they will try to see um, um, if this, if this route is possible or this, this one is better or not. A company will want to avoid rough, hilly or watery terrain, which will need to be graded or leveled. So they will actually avoid, try to avoid that. But in so many cases, if, if they needed to build it, then they would do it. They will try to avoid it because, I, like I said before, it was really difficult to just be breaking rocks, big rocks, or destroying uh, hills or mountains every time. But when we go to highways, either to, to the shore, or to the south, or to the north, we see that we have mountains and we have tr uh, trees to the left and to the right. So those were actually built by the destroying basically anything in, 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 in the middle, so any rocks or any mountains like that. The early railroad companies shows skilled, very skilled surveyors who could find the best route. So a good surveyor will develop and will create and, and eventually build uh, the best route for sure. Now the early trains, we do have the early trains in here. This is um, this is like the early trains where they were like carriages on track. You can see here in the image. John Stevens built his steam wagon and ran it around a half a mile track at his Hoboken estate in 1825. So this is like a, of course, just a, an image of how everything started. So very simple, but he, he even had the, 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 the rail, the track and everything. So it's really cool. Did he have money? Of course, he, he, of course, because he had an estate. Now having only an estate, then not everyone had that. So definitely. Now the John Bull, this is from 1893. The John Bull was a steam locomotive imported from England in 1831. It arrived in parts in Bordentown, New Jersey. Then New Jersey number one railroad was Candem and Amboy, chartered in 1830. Now, one of the first railroads in USA, in the United States, passengers could travel from New York to Philadelphia, at least 24 hour, a 24 hour journey by state coach. This one only take nine hours on the railroad. So half the trip, of course, the stage coach were eventually, uh, they eventually disappear because you will cut your, your, your trip in half with the train, so pretty amazing, pretty cool. Now, John Bill, John Bull retired from service in 1860 and lives, and this one lives at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC. This one right here that you see in the picture. Now, changes with the train travel. So in here, definitely uh, we see the train, the early tra uh, train routes between and here we can see that the, the, the routes were oriented between New York City and Philadelphia. In here, the Morris Canal opened in 1832, an important development in the trans transportation of goods across Northern New Jersey. So all of this happened in 1832, which is really, really amazing. Now, the Madison Station, we have today, this is a picture from the early, early 20th century, so early last, last uh, century. The railroad came into Madison in 1837, right? When the Morris and Nexus Railroad connected the town with Newark and Morristown. So if you have, we live right now between, I live, between Parsippany, Troy Hills, and Morris Plain. Um, you used to live in Morristown. My husband used to take the train 
because we work in Madison, he also works in Madison. So he used to take the train from Morristown to Madison. And sometimes we go very few times, but we, we have definitely, um, we have been to Newark from Morristown. So that is not new. This happened in 1837. That's when the Morris and Excess um, uh, Railroad connected Morrison to Noir. So this is something that happened 200 years ago. So it's pretty amazing. Definitely, definitely a lot, a lot of history in there and a lot of importance because New York is the big the biggest city. Or if you we can say, even though Trenton is the capital of New Jersey, New York is even more important in so many things. So going from Morristown to Newark and going that fast. Um, that faster, a lot faster than using the, the wagon or, or the, the coaches, it was amazing. Definitely a, 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 an amazing development. Now, horses, drawn vehicles certainly didn't disappear. They didn't disappear like that fast. They were kept using because not many people could afford even to be on the train station. Um, and they didn't even disappear with after when, when, when cars came. Um, and carriages coexisted for quite a while. So it wasn't something like that, like, like oh yeah, we have the train now and we have you know, we have all this, all this technology and investment and, and everything. No, they coexisted for so long, for so many, for so many years. And of course, it, it, there are some places in the world right now that they still use uh, car carriages and, and wagons, but um, for sure it, it, it lasted a long time. Now I have a treat for you, so you get to see these two are, well, the next one is really my, one of my favorite too, but this one right here, we have Madison, um, specifically the connection in, in their um, in nine, nine main streets. So on the bottom one is from 2017. And uh, on your right there, you see, you can see the museum and the left one is the same place, but in 1913. Now you see that the train, the um, the rails in the tracks of the train, now are of course um, um, up top. But before the train used to be on the road, actually on the road. So that is an amazing, amazing um, pictures. You can see the church behind in there. In the when you go there, that is that is called Green Village over there, going uh, in the uh, right uh, under under the train and going up, that's Green Village. So it's amazing that we get to have this picture in here. And you can see the poles for the train. It's just so cool, it's awesome. And then the next one, this is from the other side. So you can see, again, you can see on your left, you can see the museum in both, in both um, pictures. The other um, building that we see here on the right, it's actually contemporary with the museum. It was built at the same the same time. It was um, they were building the both things um, in 18, 1899. and it's, it's just I, I love history and the fact that we get to compare um, um, this these pictures. It's so so cool. Now, if you get to see the rows in here, it looks like they were very well taken care of. If you see, they're really um, flat. So they don't seem as bumpy as the other ones. But remember, Madison, it was a town. So if you go outside of that of that area where the train and will go, then you will have the bumpy roads that we were talking about here. But definitely, um, these two pictures, I just love them. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it give you another chance in here so you can compare and see them. Too. And even it, 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 that at that time, you can see in 1913, look at the electrics that you have, all the cables that you have. So you get a lot from this picture. And other than the train being, the tracks being lifted up uh, and and the roads being paved right now, you don't see that many difference. And of course, being black and white, but I don't see that many difference. It is the same spot. Uh, a uh, hundred years later, so it's super, super cool, super cool. And that, my friends, that is our program for today. I am going to look at you in here. It's Julie, if you are there, 
everyone. Yeah. Um, you thank go. you so much. Um, yeah, we can move into the, the Q&A portion now. So if anyone has yeah, any right. questions, you can drop them into the chat. Um, and if, yeah. I don't, if, if I don't have the answer, you can definitely, uh, we can talk about it in the email because I have the information here, but I'm not an expert on this topic. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and we can we can do that as well. So yeah, does anyone have any questions? Um, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll read them out. Give you a few minutes if you wanna think of something. Um, okay, so we have we have a question here from Melody that says, what other exhibits are at the museum? Um, so actually at the museums, we have exhibits about a little bit about everything. Um, we have wheels and, and from here, but we don't we don't specifically have a exhibits about trains or carriages. We do have um, wheels in the museum is basically early trees and crafts so it's basically about farmers tours well we have farmers we have woodworking we have black beef we have tools and exhibits about all the trades that were um, actually um, the force of the of New Jersey 200 years ago so we do not have exhibits about trains or carriages but you can definitely come and you get to see some wheels that wheels that we have and some other tools that were actually uh, we do have wheels um objects and and everything so in order to make a wheel so we that's not an exhibit but if you come to the museum or if you come to any of the programs you get to you definitely get to see it okay awesome um thank you and lynn wants to know what are the hours of the museum so museum is open from 9 a.m. Um, I'm sorry, from 10, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on daily Monday through Saturdays. And on Sundays are open from um, 11 to 3 p.m. Okay, great. And um, I'm going to be sending out a follow-up email as well with a link to the site, so to the museum's website, so you, you can get all that information as well. It's better, sometimes it's better also if you're interested in to come, it's better to call because with COVID now it's like you're probably going to get to um, to make like an appointment or something because we're trying to um, not, but the museum is not that big. So we're trying to schedule people to come so we don't have that many people inside at the same time. Sure. Okay. Oh, we have another question um, from Angie. Uh, if you are familiar with the our Arbitorium in Morristown, they have a display of oh, old carriages. It's not really a question, but that's interesting information. Ah, really good. We used to have we used to have a carriage um, on an exhibit a few years ago. Uh, then they changed because there's one exhibit that is permanent that is all about farming and it's all about uh, living on a farm in in the um, in the 1800s. But um, now they move it. It was a very pretty on carriage. I fell in love with the picture, but I couldn't see it in person. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and does anyone else have any questions? Five pages okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a lot well, of information, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I just want to uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you again, Christelle. Um, I'd like to just remind everyone again to check out our website for our other upcoming events. And as I said before, I'll send out a follow-up email and I'll include the link to the website for the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts in case you want to visit. So look out for that. Um, and that is the end of tonight's program. And I hope everyone has a nice night.
Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I hope I see you again soon. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.